Wyant. 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 Hello everyone, welcome to the Other Live Summer View Producers Group today. We are going to talk to Nick. Nick? Yeah? Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. Why and? We don't use masks in Biden's America. <laughs> I think I'm mine today. I'm going to need to pick that up. Yeah. That's like my right one and 95 and now it's on this filthy floor. No, no, no. That's, I'll get it. I'll get it later. I'll pick it up with my teeth. Anyway, <laughs> hi, how are like you? Like the popcorn, right? Yeah, like the popcorn. Oh, my God. Are there still kernels yeah. on the ground? Um, All right. I'm going to try the popcorn. I would love to kind of, I would love to try to get some. Yeah. Should I try to get some right now? No, that's fine. Are you so sure? Maybe later after Maybe the later. show. Maybe later. Okay. But that was a good bit. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Welcome, Nick. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome, Nick Wyand. Wow. So this is hell. How'd you like here? Less Catholic than I was thinking. <laughs> I don't know. What, what's the denomination of this hell? <laughs> Dead or alive? So, yes. Oh, okay. That makes sense. It's public access hell. It's like, <laughs> it's like Charlie Rose hell because of the black background. They love black here. We all yeah, love black. I don't know. I'm, we all love black in yeah. Joe Biden's America. I'm trying. I'm trying to speed run getting canceled. Why? Why end? Why end? And why? Don't why you forget end? it. Why? Why end? Nick, tell me about you. I mean. My name is Nick. I have yeah. a public access show here called Nick Wine Public Access Show, and we mostly just talk about neo Nazis and white supremacists, how stupid they are. Um, it's a show that I've had going on here for about three years now. I started in about 2019. It was originally called Nick Does a Think. The, I, first, the first name was Nick Doesn't Think. N Nick Does a Think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not doesn't. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's a better title, honestly. <laughs> that's actually a Just, really good title. Um, so it was the first title. The first, what, the first why, title. Why did you choose that first title? Uh, they, they put the paper in front of... I basically just wanted to do a show where I talked about like how stupid neo-Nazis were. And um, I couldn't think of a name for it. And they put the paperwork to become a producer in front of me. And they're like, what, what's the name of the show? And it's literally the first thing that came to mind. Cool. And it was just like, Here, here's like a, a dumb name for a show. And it's... I actually won Best New Show here, and I'm very proud of that award. I actually have it framed up in my house. Really? Yeah, I won the Best New Show of 2020. And I got nominated for like a couple of other things during that year's um, Somerville Awards program thing. And um, I lost like Best Show overall to The Labor Show. And then I ended up actually uh, befriending, and uh, I directed an episode of that show as well. So, but like, no hard feelings there. <laughs> Honest to God, there was no hard feelings. Oh. But um, yeah, like I was really proud of like my dumb show pre-pandemic was like good enough to like get that sort of an attention from the local community because it's literally just me sitting in a chair like talking about like various white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups at the time during the Trump administration. And at the time, a lot of the attention was focused on like Latino issues. At the time, I was also engaged to a, a Latino guy, a oh, Chilean really? guy. Cool. Yeah. Um, where where are he, he's from? Well, uh, we're not we're not together anymore, so who but. cares? <laughs> but um, no, no, he's he's from Denver. He's from Colorado, so um, he's never going to see this. So we can talk as dirty as we want sure, about him. Sure. Yes, he, yes, he's, absolutely. Yeah. yeah you ever not? heard of the Dark Triad? No, I haven't. The dark is triad it? is a thing in psychology. I actually discovered this because he was like the first major breakup I ever had. And um, I've really had to kind of process a lot of my feelings about um, 
how awful he was t to me during the relationship and why uh, I ended up breaking things up. How long did you up. guys stay together? I was yeah. with him for about a year and a half. We were engaged, and oh. um, I ended up breaking it off with him. And you did. You decide. I I broke things off with him last July, and then last August. Um, I don't remember the day. I think it was like the 16th or something. It was like mid, mid month or something. But it was like that's the worst day of my 2021 where I was working at the gym um, and he contacts me out of the blue um, and he's like, hey, I haven't heard from you in a while, which is kind of his talk for like, um, why haven't you been giving me attention? Sure. <laughs> sort of. And um, I'm, I. It, it was for a while? How I, long? I broke up with him in like June or July and then he contacts me in August and he's like, I haven't heard from you in a while. And it's like, wh where are you? And that's basically him saying like, I, I want you to give me attention. I need you for something. And in that case, it's that I was the guy that was running his Discord server. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, he's an influencer, he's an, he's one of them influencer types. So he has like a couple thousand people on YouTube subscribed to him. Sure. Um, his content, as far as I can describe it honestly, um, is he describes hardcore pornography to his child audience. <laughs> That's why he described. He plays okay. he plays okay. um, yaoi video games. Yaoi is like Japanese for like, ho like homosexual basically. It's like gay men, and he like plays these like adult visual novels, which are basically like comic books sort of things. But you play them as video games, and they're it's like there's a there's like this series, um, and it's like it's like boys out in the woods, and they're like 18 years old. They're like barely legal, and they're all just like having sex with each other. <laughs> And that's, that's that's the game. That's the game. It's like this like big romance novel or whatever. And he got like a hundred thousand views off of him playing it. But it's like it's because there's a hardcore sex scene in it. And he has to like censor out all the genitals and everything. And you go to the comments, and it's like twelve year olds saying like, basically like censoring it a lot here. It's like, oh, I had an orgasm to this, and I'm twelve years old. Okay. And those are the comments, and those are the viewers that he would get on his videos. <laughs> And that's okay. the content that he would be making. And um, it was kind of hard to stay with him and like defend that stuff. But it's like the whole point was that he was just trying to get famous by any means necessary. Okay. So it's like a couple thousand people on TikTok follow him, a couple thousand people on Twitter follow him, a couple thousand on YouTube and stuff. And he was just a workaholic. And it's like if he wasn't working 60 hours a week at his job at wherever he was working at the time, he was focusing on YouTube. If it wasn't YouTube, it was TikTok. If it wasn't TikTok, it was Twitch. If it wasn't Twitch, it was like making stuff for Instagram. He started doing drag recently, so he focuses a lot on that. On and on and on Dra and on. Drag? What, yeah, what like, do you mean you know, by like that? guys dressing up as women and oh, like trying cool. to perform okay. and stuff. To, uh, I mean, maybe on Twitch, TikTok too, and then social media. Yeah, basically. But it's like it, you do these things, it's like there's a difference between like like someone doing this stuff because they have like an artistic integrity to it and they want to do these things because there's something in them that needs to come out. And then there's someone like my ex where it's like you're doing it because it's like, oh, my goal is to become famous. Sure. And you want to view It's the difference between you're like for Daniel Day Lewis versus Kim sure. Kardashian. <laughs> okay. You got to. You know? So, and I don't want to spend the whole thing talking about him because I honestly wasn't even expecting to have him be brought up. But... Long story short, like he was who I was dating when I started the show. Oh, and, so it was like. Um, and at the same so time, like the the wall was the big issue at the time, and a lot of white supremacists were were like really gung ho during the Trump era because it's like the wall. We're gonna build the wall. We're gonna we're gonna keep all the Mexicans down. Mexico's gonna pay for it, and it's like, well, I'm dating a Latino guy, and also this is like the the big issue with the current administration at the time. And I just would talk about it a lot, and it was getting a decent amount of local attention, and then I won the award. And it was just like, cool. But, um, and and the name of the show at the beginning was like... Nick Does a Think. Does but, a but Think. But then the pandemic cool. happened, and, and I wasn't able to do the show regularly for about two years. Because oh, wow. this station that we're filming at right now, Somerville Community Access, was shut down. And, and so... you didn't do this... At your home, you could not this. I was trying to. To, but you couldn't. I was trying to, but the process to like get things submitted here was really cumbersome, and I had like 
work and stuff to focus on. Wow. Um, and also, I was going through my own problems with this relationship. Like, every day I felt hurt by my partner who was just uh, effectively neglecting me. And what I've, like, the last 10 months has me basically been getting over him. And so when I mentioned the thing about the dark triad, the dark triad's a thing in, in, a, psych, in, a, in psychology. It's this perfect combination of um, narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism, or like, you know, manipulation for your own self-gain. And that's my ex in a nutshell. Oh, wow. And <laughs> you, you, how did you find out that? I mean, it was, it was a process, right? It was a process, But yeah. you, you saw the red flags at the beginning? Or, I, I mean, just, you were just like... He was my first serious relationship. Yeah. And um, in retrospect, like, I didn't even really want to get engaged. He was the one that was pushing that. But I was in love with him, and I really wanted to continue being with him. And um, he was the one that was pushing all this stuff, and I just was not there for a lot of it. And at the same time, like, when I really needed him, he just was not there. I remember when I was deleting, like, because I deleted, like, everything. I have no photos. I have no video. I've got nothing of him. When you like, decide? When you decide to break his head? Nothing. When I, in, in, on that day in August. The day in August, it was really important to me last year because that was a period where I was kind of considering the future of my show because I had not been doing it. The only episodes of the show that I would do is I would do the, uh, what I call the annual Sandy Hook episodes, which I'll get to why I do the Sandy Hook stuff in a bit with the Honor Network. But um, I was sitting at the desk at the gym and I was like kind of missing him and I was like, maybe I made a mistake, maybe we should get back together. <laughs> and he reaches out to me, why did you laugh? <laughs> because you know. I you know, know you because know. I know. So, but go ahead. I did not know at the time. Okay. <laughs> so he he contacts me and he basically wants me to come back and be his Discord moderator. But he doesn't say that. He's like, oh, I miss you. And then um, I am like, I miss you. I think I made a mistake breaking up with you. Do you want to get back together? And what he says to me was, basically, he's like, only if you move to Denver, and even then, it's not a guarantee that we will get back together. Wow. Why that? Yeah. Why that face? Why? Why was that so unreasonable, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that, it's unreasonable, right? And that was quite. The, yeah. Quite that, un it was, unreasonable. It's yeah. the first moment in my life where I, I I had a moment like that. I was like, so we can't even really be friends, because like you don't even really want a relationship with me. You just kind of just want to use me, and so I just blocked him. I blocked my fiance, my ex fiance, and from. Last August onward, my life got significantly better because he was out of my life. And then... Um, Maybe he was dragging you. Oh, like, he was. When of. I was deleting all my photos and everything, because I, I got like a Google photo archive and it keeps everything like very organized. Um, every once in a while, I would like find things in there that had like his face hidden because I would like take a screenshot of like Twitch. How do you feel about that when you see his face? It used to be really traumatic and really upsetting to see his face. Yeah. And then like these days, I just, I don't care anymore. It, it does, I, I'm not hurt. Oh, but cool. But for many, many months, it was like, I blocked Twitter from my phone because he was such a, he, he he's trying to be a celebrity. He wants to be like a, he, what he always said to me was like, I want to be like the next Beyonce. Whoa. And it's like, but you have no talent. But he wants to. He right? sings off key and he does drag, but it's like he do it, he does it because he wants to be like on RuPaul and he wants to be famous. When he say the thing about like artistic intent, that's where I feel about things. And I know that like my show is like a dumb public access show and we talk about like neo Nazis and white supremacists. But it means something to me. Sure. And I keep doing it because the work is important to me and I really believe in it. And I also think it's just really fun to like a clip that I showed on tonight's show is literally just like a guy holding a Confederate flag and then he lights his hair on fire and then someone else pours water on it and then it still doesn't, his head is still on fire. Wow. <laughs> and he did this to show the superiority of white people and the Confederacy. Wow. It's great. <laughs> it's great to just to watch that stuff and just sure. be like... White supremacists, yeah, yeah, you really showed off the superiority of the white race. And also, like, they're doing this to, in, in, in to defend me. I'm a white guy. They're doing these things because they're, like, supposedly defending my honor and my safety against you as a Latino woman. <laughs> yeah. As a Latino woman. But I do not feel threatened by you, and I never have. And, like, for some reason, they are. 
Do you think so? Oh, absolutely. Like, for, okay, do, uh, do you know what an incel is? No, I don't. Uh, if you were to guess, just, just what, what do you think an incel is? I'm curious. If I'm a, say it again. Incel. Incel. Uh, okay, it's, it's, it's long for something. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a short, involuntarily celibate. Celibate. Yeah. Okay. Means they don't have sex. Okay, celibate. Yeah. Involuntary. Yeah. Uh, so, what's the question again? What do you think that means? Okay. Yeah. If you've never heard this term before, so I'm curious. What do you think an incel is? Incel? Um, it's, it's something related to Sally, uh, as you said, uh, not, not having sex. Yeah, that's literally it. That's literally it. They've, they've, yeah. It's mostly men who have constructed a very violent ideology around the fact that they are not having sex, okay. specifically with women. It's a lot of hetero men. And um, the white supremacist side of things and the incel side of things is like when they overlap basically in a Venn diagram to the point where they're basically like a full circle. Like they're basically the same thing. These are men that um, have constructed an entire identity around they do not have sex and they're very, very mad about it. And so they, they vent that outrage. On the lighter end of things, they'll go on all these social media platforms and they will rant and ramble against like anyone they perceive as a minority. And on the heavier end of things, you have things like the Van Noy shooting where an incel uh, shot up multiple locations and killed six women. And so that's where white supremacy is on the lighter end of things. On the heavier end of things, you have things like in the last weekend, there was a shooting in New York where uh, a man went into, uh, not a man, I hate even saying that word with someone like this, um, a, a boy, a dude, <laughs> okay. went, into a, went into a black uh, supermarket, a predominantly black supermarket in New York, and he shot and killed 10 people, mostly black people. He was targeting black people in the name of white supremacy. And the show was about talking about these things, and I feel like I've been ahead of the curve because the reason I did this show was no one else was really talking about these things in like a knowledgeable manner. My background is that I came from a kind of white supremacist part of Boise. Um, it's like 89% white people, and um, I grew up in what's called an Assemblies of God congregation, and the AOG congregations, in my personal opinion, are quite extremist. And they don't ever, they're very nice people. They're very kind, but they do believe that like white people are the superior chosen people. They're the kind of people who believe that like Jesus is white, even though historically Jesus was Middle Eastern. But historical facts don't matter to these people. So it's a lot of just talking about these things. And just that's, the, just, that's all the show has been for about three years now. And it, like when it, when it kind of interse intersects with my personal life, it's like, I don't know, like I, I had this whole experience with my ex where like what I was getting to before was like I was going through all my, uh, my, my messages and stuff, all these photos and stuff, trying to find anything about him to delete everything from, his, from my life. And I found a message from November of 2020, uh, which would have been like only six months after I started dating him. And it was me in Telegram, and I had typed out, um, I want to break up with you. But oh, I didn't wow. send it. Oh, wow. I didn't send it. And it's like, oh, my God, I kind of remember this. I remembered it was really important that I saved this photo. Because it's like, I Do felt, you remember the photo? I, yeah, because it, it, it was that moment of, like, I would text him on Telegram every day. Um, and we would text each other, and I would, I would try to reach out, and he just would never reply to me. And that's part of what hurt so much. After was, six months dating? After, after just a few months of dating, Fe yeah. And he was, like, just absent? Absent from my life completely, yeah. Wow. Well. And um, so I would just constantly keep reaching out to him and loving him and trying to do things. And in November, I was like, maybe the reason I'm hurting so much is that my partner just does not support me. And so I wrote out, like, I want to break up with you, but I didn't have the courage at the time to send it. And, and I stayed with him for another eight months or so. Oh, wow. So and I was yeah. with him for a year and a half. A year and a half. And yeah. did he know about your show? And did he know that you didn't were, like... Didn't support it. Like, that's, as, and even yeah. though he was, he's a Latino. Yeah. And Not he political, knew, though. I should add that. But, 
he knew that you were like bringing because he kind of inspired you, right? No. 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 Okay. That's the thing. So it was not just how. Okay. How he inspired me in that his work ethic was like, yeah, he did like TikTok and Twitch and Instagram and YouTube and all these different things. But not the fact fact that he was a Latino. I tried to incorporate oh. that into things, and I guess the reason I'm bringing it up when I talk about these incel people <laughs> is that, like, I was kind of the perfect candidate for the white supremacists to go after me in a particular moment where it's like, this is what they do because something else about me that's like, I'm not ashamed of it at all, but this is something that like, people get very finicky about is that, like, I've been a longtime member of the furry community. I love oh. being a furry. Wow. Like I've got multiple. You still, you still, you still part of this community? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I remember once I was in VR playing with my daughter. Yeah. And I found this community, and um, and the I didn't know, and I was choosing those those avatars. Yeah. Because I really, I really think it's I I don't know I think it's nice. Yeah. And I most of them, they are that from this community, the flurry. Yeah, yeah, the flurries, uh, yeah. For, uh, first, and then. And then my daughter and her friend said, oh, you like that? I said, yeah, kind of like, but I, I play just for a while. And then when they explained to me that community, and it's interesting. How, so you, how you they, still, you how still play that? How did they explain that? it to you? I'm curious. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these, uh, they kind of laugh at me because I was choosing those avatars with those tails, yeah. big tails. Yeah. And because they are, they were not from this community and they say oh you go for a different um, um community so you kind of and they start laughing at me yeah and then i say why are you guys laughing and then they say oh because that's that's a funny that's a kind of funny and weird community yeah but uh i don't know that much about this but it's that's just um, then when I, I, I was like kind of curious, so right. tell me about that. Now I have someone who is really from the community and I've, can say something more. I've, I feel like I've been a furry for like most of my life at this point. Like I've been involved at this point, God, like close to 20 years. I've only really had like a presence in the fandom for like 10 or so because that's kind of how a lot of people are. You just sort of have like a kinship to certain things growing up and then like you get what's called a fursona, which is like your persona but furry. Basically, cool. Cool. fursona. Okay. And, um, fursona. Cool. Yeah. So I've got werewolf, bald eagle, blue jay, arcanine, bull, and uh, shoot, I'm forgetting one. I got six. Basically, I've got six different fursonas. My werewolf is my main, and um, I don't know. Just like I, I have made friends in the fandom. I've made lifelong friends that I've I love and I care about, and I've flown out to see them they've flown out to see me and we just hang out we just enjoy playing video games with each other and like just it's just it's just a nice place sure. a lot of my friends in the fandom are artists and um it's been really inspiring to kind of work with them and like grow and develop my skill sets of things and there's like two sides of the fandom basically there's the safe for work side there's the not safe for work side the safe for work side is the side that i tend to stick to because it's a lot of like well lately it's it's a lot of just like Focus on the art and your development as a skill and skill as an artist, and just kind of like enjoying like just just furry stuff in general. And then there's the not safe for work side where it's like you're in it because you're here for the smut. You're here because there's a lot of like sex content. Okay. <laughs> and there's a lot of people who get into the fandom because it's like one of the things that people most know about furries is that like oh they have like lots of sex basically or like like, like that's the theory that's the thing that people think about with furries and that's just sort of the public perception and so because oh. of that bringing it back to the incels the white the the simple fact of the furry fandom is that it is overwhelmingly white overwhelmingly overwhelmingly male and a lot of these people are like you know or teens, 20s, 30s, kind of, but like younger white men. The furry fandom is kind of a perfect breeding ground for neo-Nazi indoctrination, unfortunately, because you take these angry young white men and you tell them that the reason that they're not having sex, the reason why they are sad and lonely and de depressed in life is because of the Jews or <laughs> like Latinos taking your job or black people oh, existing wow. and you indoctrinate people that way. 
And, and I feel like what I have to do with the furry fandom, not to interrupt, I'm sorry, sure. but like I try to stick around with the fandom and I try to stick to the safer work side because like when you're in this sort of environment for a long time, it's like once you've seen like, just to be blunt, like once you see enough porn, like it's all kind of the same. <laughs> so it's just not that interesting. Sure. The interesting stuff is like seeing like a new kind of like Van Gogh every single day. It's like you see like really cool and interesting art and it's really stimulating in that regard. It's like you kind of get bored with all this porn. <laughs> it's just it's, boring. It's, it's, yeah. It gets kinda. really boring and it gets very samey every single day. Whereas when you see like really beautiful stuff that someone spent hours developing and making, it's like that's really cool. And it's really cool to be part of a supportive community. And I like to try to fold in the, uh, the at-risk furries who are like being prodded by the Nazi side of things. And I'm like, no, 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 don't go over there, don't go over there, come back this way. And I like to try to shepherd them back into like the, uh, the nice side of things. And um, that's also kind of the benefit of doing my show is that it, it's sort of like my, my stress release valve. Because okay. you, kinda, you have to kind of keep a front up with some of these people that you're trying to keep out of um, harm's way. And you can't just outwardly say like, no, you idiot, don't be a Nazi. You can't say that because then they'll be like, well, you're calling me an idiot. Well, these other people, they're not calling me that. They're, not, they're being very nice to me, so I'm going to go with the Nazis. Like, you have to, if you're trying to convert people back from that sort of extremism, you have to basically play with the most sensitive kid gloves you can. And um, the, the show is basically me being able to revel in, like, how stupid this ideology is. The so show, the, yeah. The, the fact of you being part of the fur community yeah it also inspire you to talk about that because you oh absolutely yeah you're there and you observe how we it's the behavior of them and then the kind of as you said like demographics and everything it's become, and then you, you know, just let's yeah. talk about that but not just yeah. directly but you know bringing other conversation right that you feel like like you said something that they, they're unhappy. Why do you think they are happy? We live in a country right now where income inequality is very bad and there are not a lot of opportunities for really anybody. Elon Musk has lost something like $69 billion this year. Nice. But <laughs> he, that's nothing to him. The, there's a point where like you have made so much money that it does not matter. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, all these people, these billionaires, whether you like them or not, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that they have amassed these mass, these vast fortunes and you could spend so much of that money every single day for positive uses and instead they just sort of hoard it all. For what? what what's the end goal of being like a super billionaire, like an Elon Musk level where you have hundreds of billions of dollars? The end result as we are all living through is we are now living in an incredibly unequal society. And unfortunately, we are living in a conspiratorial society where at least four million Americans every night listen to people like Tucker Carlson who like to spin theories like the Great Replacement, which is why you have events like the shooting that just happened last weekend in, um, in New York. Um, we're living in a society where the simple answers, the obvious answers to things are not being pointed out because it is far more profitable to simply say your job is being taken from you by people who don't deserve it. You deserve better as a white man and you are also being replaced. And the actual answers to something like The Great Replacement is what my show is where you point out the facts of it and you also debunk the Great Replacement with one of the basic facts being with the entire population of the planet being something like seven to eight billion people, Caucasian people are only 10%. So if the Great Replacement theory is that white people are being replaced, we're already there. <laughs> so if it's just about, oh, Caucasian people are gonna become a minority within the United States, then the question becomes, well, what is white? Who, can, yep. who counts what as a white, white person? What because if you white? ask certain neo-Nazis, Chinese people are considered white because their skin color is considered lighter than white people in certain corners. But Japanese people, maybe, 
may be considered white because their skin color is lighter, but then you actually ask them, why are they considered white? Well, it's basically because they're weeps. I always, they like anime. <laughs> I always yeah, ask myself, like, yeah. am I white or what am I? You know, because it, 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 it's not depending anymore like the color of your skin. It's something like it's, it's your background, where you, where you were born, you know, and it's like your last that. name or yeah. I don't know what is it, what it is. There is no there, there. There's nothing. The the honest truth about like what what constitutes white has been yeah. changing for centuries now. Italian people used to not be considered white. True. Irish people were not considered white a hundred years ago. Now they are. What changed? Yeah. What what was the rule, and what made the change to now like Italian people who used to not be considered white. Now they're considered white people. Why did that happen? The answer lies, in my view, in the hilarious story of a neo-Nazi named Craig Cobb. Craig okay. Cobb is a guy who tried to found a white supremacist town in an existing place called Leith, North Dakota. And so what he did was, this town of Leith, North Dakota already existed. It was a population of, I believe, like 15 people. And so what he did was he was buying up all the lots of land and all the houses and all the property in and around Leith, North Dakota. And he was inviting all of his white supremacist buddies there so that he could create a neo-Nazi white supremacist uh, paradise. And then he got invited onto a uh, show, I believe it was called Trish or Trisha, who is a uh, black daytime TV sh talk show host. And Craig Cobb, white supremacist genius he is, agreed to do a DNA test. And it found out that he was a not unsubstantial part of his DNA was sub-Saharan African. And after the other white supremacists found that out, they drove him out of town. Well. Because that's what happens. The end result of all this white supremacy is that it's basically dog eat dog. The the book that's considered the 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 um, the Bible of the racist right, as it's been called, is a book called the Turner Diaries. It was written in 1979 by a committed neo-Nazi no, named um, William Luther Pierce. He ran an organization called the National Alliance, um, and I. I'll bring that up for, for many reasons in a second, but like basically the book uh, was the inspiration for the uh, Oklahoma City bombing. There is a part of the book, early on, mind you, that um, the book is important for two details. The first is that the story of, of it is basically like considered one of the guidebooks and the planning, uh, the, the plans for like what do the white supremacists ultimately want. Well, the ending of the book is that they basically irradiate the planet. They basically kill all the non-white people, and then the, the earth is left, and like, I could have gotten a bad copy of the book, I could have read this wrong, but from the gist of it, it's basically like, at the end of the Turner Diaries, they nuke the planet, and there's only 30,000 people left. Only 30? There's only 30,000, and they're all white. 30,000. There's only 30,000 white people left on the planet. And it sounds like, from what I've read in the book, it sounds like... It's dog-eat-dog dog still, because that's the end goal of all white supremacy, is it's not really to get rid of all minority people, it's to be the supreme one amongst all the people. So even if you got to this point where it's like, yeah, there's no black people left, what then? You end up with Leith, North Dakota. You get this whole group of white people together with this hateful ideology, and what are hateful people going to do? They're going to hate. And then they're going to turn on each other, as is what naturally happens with all these white supremacist groups. And they start backstabbing each other. And then you end up with hilarious stories like what happened with Luther Pierce's uh, National Alliance when, when he died. He wrote this book, uh, The Turner Diaries. It's considered the seminal work of like white supremacy. It's like one of two books. It's The Turner Diaries by Andrew McDonnell, which is his pen name. And then there's uh, Siege by James Mason, who is a neo-Nazi who lives in Denver now, by the way. And he, oh, wow. he uh, cannot afford anything anymore. And he uh, eats at a soup kitchen. And he uh, grabs carts at Target, last we ever saw of him. Because that's the end result of real-life neo-Nazism. Nobody wants you. Nobody accepts you. So you take, this, you take this ideology on, and it just poisons society against you. And it just makes you more hateful. And I feel like that's why the importance of my work is with the furries, is that 
there's a better way to live, which is to not be hateful. It's to be kind of, you know, positive and, aff and affirmative towards people. It's nice to be nice, basically. And for a community, it's a nice community. Uh, it can be. Um, there's, I'm not on Twitter because um, furry Why Twitter. Why not Twitter? Furry Twitter in particular is extremely toxic. Um, I've been talking a lot about the right wing, but we don't really talk about the left that much. The left wing has been particularly vicious on mm. social media. Yeah. And my personal feelings on that is like, I, I'm out. I'm well, out. That's when, interesting that you're bringing that conversation about that, that it's been like, like really vicious, you know? Have you I ever have heard of, noticed that. Have you ever heard of uh, cancel culture? Uh, no. Cancel no. culture cancel is this, is this, oh, this okay. cancel culture is this idea of like, from my understanding, from what I've, uh, I've never like experienced this personally, but I've seen this enough times of like, you get this like online mob of people to go after one person in particular, and that's it. That's and like the and gist a, and of it. An attack. Yeah. And then just like. Um, and there's there's like. The, so the, the it's, it's called cancel culture. Cancel culture, yeah, and like. So because it's the person is kind of canceled, or. That's no. that's the idea is like like you're oh. canceled and it, like the story of it the popular story that gets told is it gets started with like, you couldn't do anything about like Harvey Weinstein or R. Kelly or Bill Cosby up until canceling because then you had this mass collection of voices who were like stay away from R. Kelly because he is like kidnapping girls and like keeping them as sex slaves in his place or whatever. And then finally something was being done about it. And that's like the power of the Me Too movement. And where it's kind of spun out of control from there is you have this like avalanche of people who will go after basically each other. And it's the sort of same thing that I noticed with the neo-Nazis, where it's like um, um, one of my favorite segments I ever did on my po on my show was the the, uh, the 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 Wikipedia page for like list of existing neo-Nazi groups. There's like a short box of like currently existing neo-Nazi groups in the world. It's like maybe two or three sentences, and then there's like this big box of like defunct neo-Nazi groups. Because the end result of this ideology is you all turn on each other, you all end up hating each other, because that's what hate groups do. They hate. So they all end up turning on each other. They and need that conflict. They look for a conflict. And that's unfortunately the problem I see now with a lot of the online left, is that they, instead of tackling the larger issues of inequality and the larger issues of <clears throat> moving, I put myself on the left politically, and I would advocate for leftist positions, but I do not do it on social media because that is where discourse goes to die. You do not get anything done engaging True. with Twitter. True. It's, I do not know anyone personally who still uses Twitter who does not refer to it as the hell site. And they don't call it like, oh, I go on Twitter and I like scroll or I look through. They all call it doom scrolling. And I asked them, like oh, my so friends who are still on it. It's called doom scrolling. It's okay. actually a, a recognized condition by the Mayo Clinic because mm -hmm. it's actually a considered a public health issue. During the pandemic, people were locked in their houses. True. And they were for days on end, like they would just ch check Twitter and just check their phones sure. because that's all they had to do. Nothing to do. Yeah, just that. Too. And it would it. just make people feel awful. And that's doom scrolling. Yeah. And the reason for it, according to the Mayo Clinic, is basically like the process of being on Twitter and like scrolling constantly, it feels like you're learning something. And that's the engagement of it. But it's addictive and it's addictive by design. And I don't engage with social media personally because the things that have come out about like Meta and like their, comp their, their things like, like Instagram. Instagram is known to cause suicidal ideation in mm -hmm. teenage girls. Mm -hmm. I could never be on a platform that, that does that or that could support that. Absolutely, yeah. It's the same thing with um, with Facebook, like just being True. on Facebook personally. So you are, you are, are, are you on Facebook? No, I'm not on anything. I'm uh, a hermit. Yeah, I'm not on Facebook either. I'm not on Instagram either. Because what, why I feel not for that you? It, yeah. Mm, because I see those um, people just fighting and doing nothing and talking about everything that it's not important exactly. talking about everything that is so shallow that and then wasting their time yeah. i'm not going to waste my time no exactly so it's just seeing seeing pictures that it's they are not just they are not real 
pictures, you know, it's just like an um, uh, object there. Yeah. So I want to be the subject, not yes. an object. Yeah. So that's why I don't put myself there, you One, know? Yeah. Because you, you, when, you when you take a picture of yourself or yeah. when you're there, you were putting you part of uh, a media and the uh, object. You, were, you, you have this responsibility of turning yourself in an object and yeah. putting there. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's that transition of from a subject. We are subjects, right? Yes. We act, we can do things. But if you just put yourself there, like everybody's doing that. So when I see also a lot of people doing the same thing, I, I always ask myself, is that right? I'm going to do this because I really want to do, I see a purpose doing that, or I'm going to do the, what everything, everybody's doing. Right. You know, going with the mass. I mean, just f following the mass. So it's something that I always try to do the opposite, to have a break and think by myself. So that's why yeah. when we talked last time, I saw something really interesting in you. And now I'm learning more about you, and then I really thanks for I, having me on. I hope I haven't yes, been boring. Yes, I, I hope I haven't been blabbering. No, it's it's really interesting that you're bringing all those topics that, as you said today, that that's cool. That's nice. Did you just break yeah. this chair. That's that's fine. That's funny. <laughs> that's okay. That, I was just trying um, to grab my water. As you said, you don't see really um, interesting things on social media like that topic and that conversation that we're having here, right? It's... Um, you, you don't, and that's partially by design. Like... Um, what, what do you mean by, by design? That it's um, the... The, the, I mean... The design of this? The, the, the algorithms that govern okay. social media. Okay. They, they effectively control the ebb and flow of what happens. And also, this is something that's been known for a while, but like New York Times back in, I believe, 2015 had a big expose about like, uh, the valence emotion was the term that was used, but like basically like the emotion that causes people to engage the most is anger. So whatever makes people angry will make them um, uh, keep them engaged and on the platform. Aww. This is something that also got reinforced with the Francis Hogan uh, Facebook whistleblower reports that came out late last year. Basically, you keep people angry and they stay engaged on the platform. They stay engaged on the platform, they keep looking at ads. And so when you're talking about the quality of these conversations, you're absolutely on the mark. There's no, there's nothing valuable. You cannot go there for conversations, which sucks because I used to love Twitter. Twitter was my favorite platform because it was- For me too, Twitter was nice. It yeah. felt like like a genuinely intellectual place. Yeah, a long time ago. Could talk. Right, yeah. And now it's like, no, it's, yeah. a, it's a cesspit. At the beginning it was really interesting. Yeah, I actually was on there earlier because um, I volunteer with an organization and I had to go on there. Um, in part because like another big reason why I'm not on social media is that like I'm just kind of burnt out by it. Um, can I talk about the Honor Network? Okay. Yeah. So the uh, Honor Network was founded by Leonard Posner in 2014. Um, in the aftermath of the Sandy Hook shooting, um, Leonard lost his son Noah at Sandy Hook in 2012. And then in 2013, the Boston Marathon bombing happened. And around that time, um, Leonard had been trying to contact uh, Infowars and various people who were saying that Sandy Hook did not happen. And then also they were saying things like the Boston Marathon bombing did not happen. And um, this is something that has unfortunately popped up a lot since Sandy Hook, where you have people who claim that Sandy Hook did not happen. They claim that it's a false flag attack and that it's like a, a government-sponsored thing to, to take away your guns, and which has clearly happened. Like, it's, it's the same thing. Like, the, my show is a lot of just kind of pointing out the obvious, I feel like, but we've been so conditioned and gaslit to, like, not say the obvious anymore because, like, we're so used to having to deal with the extremists who and the crazy people. So if you say, like, Sandy Hook is very obviously not a thing that was used to take away guns because everyone still has their guns, you have, like, basically two responses to that. The first being from the crazy people. It's like, well, yeah, because we stood up for our gun rights and stuff, which obviously is not true. 
the, the answer there was basically like the NRA fought and succeeded at stopping a lot of legislation in the aftermath of Sandy Hook. Um, and then the second answer is basically like we have to deal with like these crazy people who like they'll just spew out a whole bunch of nonsense and there's no way you can ever even reach them to the point where like I could say like 50 or 60 different excuses that like the right wing will say about just Sandy Hook alone like the false flag theory or whatever and it's like all of it's debunked all of it's not true but does debunking it matter? No. This is also why I can't be on social media anymore because it's like what's the point of conversing with some of these people? When I'm talking to like the, the, the furries, the younger people, I'm dealing with a generation who has grown up with mass shootings. And I've dealt with people who grew up around where very big ones happened. My ex-fiance was actually in the area when the Aurora, the Cinema 16 Batman shooting happened because he was at a midnight screening at another theater in that area um, that night in uh, uh, June or July 2012. He was at a midnight screening somewhere else and everyone was panicking because there was a mass shooting that just happened at a theater no less than like two, three miles from wow. there. And you could see and hear all the sirens and all the commotion and all the helicopters in the area taking video from overhead. It's terrifying. And also he was born in that area where Columbine happened. And I will remember being there and meeting one of his best friends at the time. Um, and talking to them, be like, what was it like growing up in this area where like Columbine happened? And it was like, every single lockdown was taken deadly seriously because Columbine happened like less than a mile away from our school. Wow. So there was a threat of a kid who brought a gun to a school like when my ex was like, I think he said he was like 14 or something. And it was like the biggest lockdown. And you have this generation of kids I grew up with that. I grew up with having to Did do you? lockdowns. Wow. Yeah, I, I remember being in kindergarten and it's like we all had to hide in the cubby space behind the big wall or whatever, or like we had to hide under our desks. Where, where are you from? I'm where from Boise, me? Idaho. Um, this is also incidentally why the white supremacy stuff is so interesting to me because Idaho mm. growing up was 89% white. Oh wow. Yeah, we had a very small population of um, Mexican people who would come up from there to like work in the fields. And that's like the only minority people that we really knew of in the state. And I was kind of proud of my state growing up because it's like, I think around 2006, we started accepting refugees from various like war torn areas in Africa. And so we were starting to get like more and more like black people from Africa in the state. And I was really proud of us. And then I moved here and I started to learn like, oh wait, no, there's like just people who exist all over the place in a city. We're all just mixed together and that's just kind of how things should be. And I just grew up in this like super white area and the predominant view, it was never said out loud because that's the thing. Oops, my anarchy symbol. Um, the thing with white supremacists is like you never, they, they call it acknowledging your power level you never say out loud, like, I'm a neo-Nazi, I'm a white supremacist. And I grew up with that. No one ever said, I'm a neo-Nazi, I'm a white supremacist. But they sort of in hush-hush tones would basically say, like, we are kind of better than the, uh, the, the others <laughs> in their own little way. And then they would go back to feeding you or whatever because they're ultimately nice people, but they're just very misguided. And, like... That's where I grew up with. And so when I come out here and I'm like, oh, wait, I grew up with this. <laughs> I just got very fascinated with it. And that's why I do the show. When did you move here? Uh, 2013. Yes, and where do you live now? Um, do, you want, do, you want, do you want my address? or? If you want to give me your address, that's fine. It's up to you. But if from Somerville. It would Somerville, make the incels mad you, to have you, you come over. You. <laughs> um, I could give you my social security number. <laughs> You're from Somerville. I'm, uh, I'm, I live in Somerville now. You live in I've lived here nine years. I actually just passed nine years. Yeah. So you now you, you are local. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And this I know is, the area. This is how you, you found Somerville Media Center. I started coming here like the same year I moved here because oh, I used to do... Oh, tell me about that. I used to do um, directing. I worked at a... Uh, public access station in Boise called Treasure Valley Community Television and 80% of our programming there was religious 
And I got my start there because our church had a public access show called Oops, Outstanding Overwhelming Possibilities to Spread Contagious Joy with Pastor Sharon Rose White. And um, she was the sister of my pastor growing up. The man's name was Ted Buck. And he was my pastor growing up. And I always liked him, but his flock was extremist. And they were absolutely white supremacist. And it's just become so clear in the aftermath of it. Um, and I just, I, I grew up with these people and I grew up with this ideology always in the back of my mind. And then I discovered that in Northern Idaho, the Aryan nations had a compound at Hayden Lake. Um, they were an out and out neo-Nazi group that owned property and they were just openly out there <laughs> in Hayden Lake in, uh, in Northern Idaho. And no one stopped them. They just existed for like 20 years because, you know, freedom of speech or whatnot. And I'm not saying that I would have stopped them, but like the reason that they are no longer there is because they shot at and kidnapped a mother and her son who were traveling through the area. And they sued the Aryan nations and they won control of the compound and they gave it to the local University of Idaho. And now it's just a park. It's called the Peace Park down there. But that's like, that's where I grew up. That's wow. where I grew up. Wow. So naturally, of course, the, the public access show would be about it. And I guess the reason I brought up my ex earlier is like, I did really have like the ultimate opportunity to become like a virulent racist because this is the same path that a lot of these people ended up going down is that like, they don't really become white supremacists or neo-Nazis because like, oh, my daddy taught me these things or whatever. A lot of them in my personal experience, maybe that's some of them, but a lot of them in my experience is like, they had an experience like mine where like, um, the reason why this grandmotherly person, I, I loved to death, her name was Wilma. Um, she did not like black people in my church. Um, she did not like black people, but she didn't like black people because in 1978, a black man robbed her husband and shot him. Wow. And killed him. So, like, I get and why she, you're. She, um, she saw that she was. She's part of this. She, she wasn't uh, there when he was killed. Yeah, but, but it's like your husband was killed in Oakland, California, by a black man. And it's like I get it. I get why you don't like black people. But it's not all black people. And you kind of need to get over this at some point. But she didn't. She held on to this for like 30 years afterwards until she died. And what I would hope my show would be is kind of an interrupter to kind of talk to these people in my way and say like, I'm not gonna condescend to you, I'm not gonna speak down to you, but you're wrong. And I'm gonna convince you that you're wrong and I'm gonna make you stop being a neo-Nazi and stop being a white supremacist. That's the goal of the show. Um, and I feel like I've been doing okay. Like I don't, Think I like I honestly I don't even know if anyone really watches it, but I feel like it's made me better at being able to confront these people when I talk to them online, because that's kind of what I do in my off hours. I, I like try to talk to incels and I try to tell them like, because a lot of the time when I talk to these guys, they haven't been outside in days, they haven't talked to another person, you, they haven't you, been touched is, in when weeks. When you say those guys, you talking, you have an audience. This, Sorry, what? You have this audience that you talk to your audience, your um, people who watch you. I have, I have a couple people that watch sure. me and I've had people like comment on the show locally, but like uh, I have a viewership of like maybe 10, 20 people. <laughs> yeah. I, don't do it, I don't do it for the views though. I do it for my own artistic integrity, if you will. And I do it because I think I'm actually getting better at being able to talk to these people because this is, gives me an outlet to like practice these things, sure. keep up to date on them. Because, honest to God, like most days, I do not look this stuff up. I'm too busy living my life. I'm in school. I'm in finals right yeah, now. Yeah, tell me, how was your day today? You say you had a day off uh, today. I did not have it. Well, it, it was off, or no? It was an busy. off day because I had, a fin I had my American history final yesterday, and like it's my seventh final I've done because I was taking eight classes this semester. Wow, cool. I, um, yeah, this is, the, this is what I was getting to with the X stuff. I'm so sorry, I just jumbled around. I had an experience where I broke up with my ex in July last year. I blocked his ass everywhere in August. Good. And then I went to 
Midwest Fur Fest, which is like the largest furry convention in the world in Chicago. And I had a whole experience there of like, wow, I hate this. <laughs> because I've been to enough furry cons that I really had the expectation that How like... How was that? The, I mean, it was uh, fine. When? It was fine. And when, like, when was it? The, the... Uh, last December. Okay. It's like December 2nd through the 5th. And like I, the first thing that happened was like literally I get to the hotel and my ex is just right there. And oh wow. He told me the last time I talked to him was like, oh, I've decided I'm a party animal now. Oh, he's a fur too. Well, he, yeah, that's how we met. We, we were in the furry fandom. Okay. But like um, he starts talk. he talks to me and he's like, oh, I'm a party animal now. And what does he mean, party animal? Uh, he just like drinks and does a lot of drugs and, and like does a lot of dancing and probably like has lots of sex and it's, 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 it's like dumb bad lifestyle. Columbia. Okay. <laughs> he looked terrible. His skin was gray. His face was there was no color in his face. There was no color in his hands. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I looked at his lifestyle of like he was an al he is an alcoholic, and like he's a. There's, there's all these allegations of like maybe he's doing drugs and he's whatever like but like so he doesn't look like Beyonce. He looks like he's aged like 20 <laughs> years and like six months. It was genuinely shocking to see my ex be wow, like that's, young, handsome, that's hot guy to like old Chilean man in like a wow. couple of months because wow. that's what the hard party True. lifestyle does. Absolutely. And yeah. um, I know we got to wrap it up, but like. I, I saw that, I had some experiences of like trying to talk to people and like, if you go to enough of these conventions, it's like, these are basically, to, to wrap it up, because we only got like a few minutes, it's like, furry conventions are social events put on for anti-social people. <laughs> they are not sociable people and it's not very fun to go there and try to talk to people and try to meet people because a lot of the time you try to talk to someone and they will just pull out their phone because they are so unused to in-person social contact, they literally shut down. They cannot handle it. Are they more into like uh, online stuff? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Virtual. Yeah. Virtual life and nothing that, that uh, in person. Yeah. In person, it's, it's hard for them. So I had that experience. I had a couple of other experiences, but it's basically like we only got like two minutes left, unfortunately. So. I kind of was like, wow, I really need to change my life. And so I decided to go back to school. And I'm in finals right now. And I had my American history final yesterday. I don't know if I passed or not because I haven't gotten the grades yet. But literally, I get home and I couldn't go to sleep for a while. And then when I did at like midnight, 1 AM, I just conked out. And then I woke up today at 2 PM. My, my body just went like, nope, nope, you're out. That's it. Because I've just been under way too much stress lately and pressure. And the but, finals too, right? It's a lot of things. <sighs> but, yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot of going on. The yeah. finals, it's so when when you're gonna be like more free time to. My last final is May 28th. Um, hopefully, I can get a little bit more time off of work to focus on the show because I want to try to make it better. Um, oh man, I barely even got to talk about the Honor Network on here. But like, yeah, like. Talk about this. I would well, love to. Well, we only to, got like a minute left, yes. right? That's fine. How much time yeah, do let's have? Ju let's talk about this because I would like to know yeah. also. We only have like ten seconds apparently. So. I don't think so. I think we have two minutes. All right. Yeah. Well, anyway, I guess if I could wrap it up, uh, the only reason it's on my mind is because the Honor Network. Uh, so what we do is basically in the aftermath of any shooting, we go online, we flag content from. I think like Alex Jones, infowars -y kind of stuff. It's like, oh, this attack didn't happen. These people didn't actually die. That is devastating for those families because not only have you lost someone, you now have like this online troll who was saying like, haha, you're an actor. Your family didn't actually die. Your friend didn't actually die. And it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. And it's cruel and it's awful. And um, what we do is we go online and we flag that kind of content. And that's what I'm going to be doing tonight because there's been a shooting in Texas today. And I got to go do that. As that's what I saw when, it, when I got here today. You were like. Literally on the uh, air today. Like I, yeah. I get the news and I'm like, I immediately jump into action mode where like I have to hop on to, because I run the Honor Network's uh, uh, action Twitter account. And I like, that's the job. And quite literally like uh, within a couple of seconds of being on there, like you see like l bodies and limbs sure. and stuff like that. It's, it's gross, but it's like I've done this so many times. I'm just dead at it, and that's dead air live. 
and uh, uh, you're like, so it's going to be about what? You have a plan? I never have a plan. So, it's literally, it's literally just like the day before, but and, maybe I can have better planning. Sure. Yeah. Now that I'm off of finals, so. But I'd, in two I'd weeks. like to get back to a structured format of it. But cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tune in. Find out what's up. Thanks for coming, Nick. Yeah. It was great talking to you. Mm. And yeah, I have a lot of questions, but maybe next show we can talk more about yeah, the future of your your show here. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Dead or Alive Producers Group Somerville. Thank you. Thanks, Theo. You did great on camera. And cool. Cool. All right. Wow, cool.